Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. His presence is in this room. The sweetness of God is in this house. I want you to turn in your Bibles, if you will, to a couple of passages. I want you to go to Mark chapter 11 to begin with. Mark chapter 11, then the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah is a few books prior to the book of Psalms. I want you to find that, and I want you to camp out there for a few moments. We bless the Lord. Joni, thank you for that word. Thank you for singing the word. Thank you for blessing the Lord through the spontaneity of and the privacy of your own walk with the Lord. Don't you love Joni? Don't you love our worship team? My Lord in heaven. I cannot wait till this evening as Pastor Derek Snodgrass is going to be with us as we are moving well beyond our fifth year anniversary and moving into our sixth year of continuous revival in the presence of God, the tangible presence of God. I don't know if I could handle much more than what I received on Sunday night last week. The glory of the Lord was in this room. All week long, I've been feeling the effects of that. It's been reverberating in my spirit. The Lord instructed me to be very direct this morning out of Mark chapter 11 and the book of Nehemiah. When you pastor in revival, it's different than pastoring when you're not in revival. Because when you're not in revival, the whole world of subjects and topics are open to you. I'm gonna say it again. You know, I could talk about parenting today and we all need to learn how to be parents and do be better parents. Or I can talk to you on six steps to financial freedom and we all need that. I can talk to you on how not to go insane with unruly neighbors, and we all need that from time to time. You understand what I'm saying? A pastor outside a revival has like an encyclopedia of opportunities. But in the midst of revival, you are pastoring a moment, and every moment builds upon the previous moment. And today's moment will have an impact on tomorrow's moment. Does that make sense to you? Moves of God are not promised to people, groups, churches. They are birthed. Moves of God are not promised and sovereign. They are not sovereign. They just don't come simply because God chooses to pour out his spirit on a particular group of people. It doesn't happen because God gets an inkling to bless somebody. There is a conception that takes place in the spirit of a man and the seed of God. When God sees that the spirit of man is ovulating, He's bled out, flushed out the old, is now in the receptive mode. Clean, pure, and thirsty for the seed. Everything inside of that uterus longs to give life. An egg is released. And its sole purpose is to hang out for a season.
God sees the core of a man or a woman and the seed of God. Mm -hmm. When a man becomes broken and a man becomes contrite and repents of his or her sins and says, God, I want you more than I want my next breath. He is preparing his womb the seed of God. Revivals are not sovereign. They're birthed. Through the canal of desperation and hunger. I can long to have revival, every pastor does, but there is a process that his physical body, soul, mind, and spirit, and his church has to go through in order to house revival. And then they war over that and protect it and then give birth to it. When God gives birth to a church that's in revival, then now the pastors, elders, staff, church members, covenant partners, friends have to parent, oversee, guard, protect the move of God. Many moves of God has stopped because of neglect. Are you guys okay? I know. I know you're thinking. I know you're thinking. But moves of God stop not because God wants them to stop. Can you, you know, I know there's talk about Moves of God come to a divine end. It serves its purpose. Well, when has healing ever stopped serving a purpose? When has brokenness and repentance and, he, and, and emotional healings ever been God's will to stop that? Why would he stop something that he longed to begin in the first place? So there's no season for a revival, in my opinion. Now, others that are smarter than I am that, uh, that research this, and give their life to understanding it, may have a different opinion. But I, in my understanding, I, do, I see there's no reason why God would ever want to stop the Hebrides revival or the Welsh revival or the Azusa Street revival or the Brownsville revival or the Toronto blessing. Do you hear what I'm saying? Or the yeah. Smithton outpouring, all of, all of those wonderful things. But they all came to an end to some degree, but yet they continue to live on, but yet that nucleus has, has come to an end. And if you research it correctly, you will find that many of them stopped because of a number of factors. Number one, fatigue. Number two, inattention to prayer. Number three, neglect of oversight of their spiritual intimacy with the Lord. And so it became a duty. It became an obligation. It became what our church does. You see, you can backslide in the middle of a move of God because it becomes rote. It, uh, it just becomes... A, a, a routine, it becomes, well, this is now what I do. And we neglect our physical, we neglect our spiritual, and we neglect prayer. My biggest fear as a pastor is that our congregation will neglect prayer. And it becomes, well, somebody else will do it. Do you hear what I'm saying? Now, the reason I said all of that is to get us to this text. There's something that Jesus did in Mark chapter 11 that you'll find quite interesting. In fact, I want to read it to you. And I want to just spend as a, a, a pit stop here for just a moment. Jesus is coming into the city. The triumphal entry is verses 1 through 10. They proclaimed to him to be, you know, the king Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Father, Hosanna in the highest. And then it says, Jesus, in verse 11, went into Jerusalem, into the temple. Everybody say temple. So when he had looked around at all things, as the hour was already late, he went out to Bethany with the 12. Now, I want you to find your pen, and I want you to get out um, your notepad, and I want you to write down the words, or even underline it in your Bible, that where it says, and Jesus looked around at all things. Everybody say, looked around at all things. Now, where was he when he was looking around? 
he was in the temple. Then your Bible says, verse 12, the next day when they had come out from Bethany, he was hungry, and then he saw the fig tree and that he had cursed previously. Now verse 15, they came to Jerusalem, then Jesus went into the temple and began to drive out those who bought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. I find this quite interesting that Jesus gets to the city, not to his hotel or where he was staying in Bethany, but he decided to come into Jerusalem and the first place that he went to was the temple. And the Bible says that Jesus walked into the temple. Now listen to this. He walked into the temple, his house, and he just took a look around, an observer, watching perhaps taking some mental notes. Maybe Matthew was beside him as a writer and just basically said, hey, I need you to write these things down. I don't know. But he's taking a look around. He's looking at every facet of the temple. He goes outside, goes to Bethany, sleeps, comes in the next morning, and then he walks back into the temple and he takes the tables and he turns them upside down and he drives out the people out of that court of the nations where the people had gathered, Right? Nehemiah, go there. There is a story of a man who had a burden for the people of God in the city of Jerusalem. In the Old Testament, Nehemiah saw that the walls had been ruined. He cried out, he prayed, he sought God, and he says, I'm gonna rebuild the walls. Touch your neighbor and say, rebuild the walls. Now watch this. And so he rebuilt the walls in 52 days. A phenomenal feat. The Bible says that while he was rebuilding the walls, he came against some opposition. I want you to look at verse three of chapter four. Now I'm just building for a few moments. Now stay with me because all of this is going to make sense in light of where we are as a congregation and where you and I live. Verse three, as Nehemiah were, as he and the team were building the walls, the Bible says there's a guy by the name of Tobiah, the Ammonite was beside him and said, whatever they build, And even if a fox goes up upon it, he will break down their stone wall. In other words, Tobiah, among others, mocked them. Verse seven, now it happened when Sanballat and Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites, and the Ashodites heard that the walls of Jerusalem were being restored and the gaps were beginning to be closed, they became very angry. So Tobiah mocked them, now became angry. Chapter six, verse one. Now it happened when Sanballat, Tobiah, Geshem, and the Arab, and the rest of the enemies, everybody say enemies. The rest of the enemies heard that I had rebuilt the wall and there were no breaks left in it at that time. And so what he's saying is, there is a progression of this gentleman by the name of Tobiah who saw a work of God, began to mock it, became angry at the progression of it and was a sworn enemy of the children of Israel. Do you see that? Everybody say Tobiah. Nehemiah builds the wall, then he takes a span of a few years and leaves Jerusalem. And he gives them the full reins of the city. I rebuilt it, we established the temple, you have a priest, You have the functionality of a a fully operating city and I'm going back to where I came from but I am now leaving this with you. Are you with me? Now, Nehemiah chapter one all the way to verse 12 talks about this. Chapter 13. Verse one, on that day, they read from the book of Moses in the hearing of the people, and it was found written that no Ammonite or Moabite should ever come into the assembly of God. The Bible says 
in Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 3, that Tobiah was what? An Ammonite. No Ammonite or Moabite should ever come into the assembly of God. Now, here's the reason why. Because they had not met the children of Israel with bread and water, but hired Balaam against them to curse them. However, our God turned their curse into a blessing. So it was when they heard the law that they separated all the mixed multitude from Israel. From the time that Nehemiah left and went back to his particular responsibilities, there became a mixture of the Ammonites and Moabites reacquainting uh, re, um, themselves with the Israelites. Verse four, watch this. Now before this, Eliashib, the priest, having authority over the storerooms of the house of our God, there was a priest over the temple. Who oversaw all the spiritual activities in the house of God. The voice of revival and restoration Nehemiah had left. The urgency, the call to holiness and purity, righteousness and consecration had left. Now a new priest had come in, and over time, your Bible says this. Now watch this, fascinating. That this priest, overseer of the house of God, and who had authority over the storerooms of the house of God, your Bible says became allied with Tobiah. I feel the Holy Ghost. I know I'm walking slowly through this and I'm being very careful on how I say what I'm about to say and what I said in the few, last few moments, but here's the, the truth. The man of God, the priest, was not the voice of fire and revival. It was one of accommodation. It was one of placating. It was a consumer-based mindset. How do I satisfy customers? How do I keep the house of God operational? And your Bible says that he became allied with Tobiah. Tobiah, an Ammonite, was even forbidden to be in the house. And how is it that a man of God, woman of God, in this context, the priests make an alliance with a sworn enemy of God that mocked them, mm, ridiculed them, and was the sworn adversary of the work and the progress of God? This got so crazy that Elisha got in such an alliance with Tobiah that he says, I don't want you to live outside the city. I want you to live inside the city and I want you to live inside the house of God. Look at what it says. He prepared him a large room. Who did? The priest where previously they stored the grain offerings, the frankincense, the articles and the tithes of grain and new wine and oil, which were commanded to be given to the Levites and the singers and gatekeepers and the offerings for the priests. Look around, look at this picture right here. I want you to, I want you to see this. I want you to see this is the temple in Solomon's day, and outside the temple, do you see it right there? There were the store chambers. Here's another picture. Around the exterior of the house of God, there's the altar, the sea, of, the bronze, and, and then all the most holy place, but outside on the perimeter were what we would call storerooms, right? Now, these storerooms, people would bring their tithes of grain, 
oil, resources, and this is how they funded the house of God and the work of God. This is how people that were like the Levites, the singers and the gatekeepers were taken care of. They were paid from these storehouses and these storerooms. This is how they did it. Remember Malachi chapter three, what does God say to us? Bring the tithe into what? The storehouse so that there may be what? Food in my house. So understand what's happening here. Elisha, the priest, was in such an alliance with Tobiah, the sworn enemy of God, who mocked him and was trying to prevent the work of God, somehow entered into a relationship to him and said, listen, I, need, I want you to have a dwelling place in the house of God. And I'm going to give you an apartment in one of these storerooms so that you can be in the house. It doesn't make sense. Jump down to verse six. But during all of this, I was not in Jerusalem. For in the 32nd year of Artaxes, king of Babylon, I had returned to the king. Then after certain days, I obtained leave from the king and I came to Jerusalem and discovered. Now watch this. Here's Nehemiah talking about this relationship. I discovered the evil that Eliashib had done for Tobiah in preparing a room for him in the courts of the house of God. And it grieved me bitterly. And then your Bible says, and I commanded them to cleanse the rooms, to bring back the articles of the house of God with the grain offerings and the frankincense. I realized that the portions for the Levites had been not given to them, for each of the Levites and the singers who did the work had gone back to the field. So I contended with the rulers and said, why is this house of God forsaken? All the atrocity of the leaders, the elders, accommodating a Tobiah in the holiest structure in Jerusalem, making an alliance with them. Do you hear what I'm saying? And this word alliance that is found in Nehemiah basically means that I'm going to be in a relationship and have union with you. I am going to accommodate you. We're going to have a partnership. We're going to have some friendship. There's going to be like interest, if you will. We're going to be associated together. Now, your Bible makes it abundantly clear in this context that an Ammonite was not to even be in the house of God. I'm here to tell you from this pulpit that it is likely and possible in the midst of a move of God, seeing the signs and the wonders and the miracles and the legs growing and the eyes popping open and the deaf ears coming back where they are literally Un, literally medically impossible to happen and you can witness the power and demonstration of God and within a moment's notice make room in your heart for a Tobiah. This went on for an extended period of time to the point of where those that were in charge of feeding the people spiritual food, leading them in worship, taking care of the house of God, got so crowded out by the other interests, other desires, other concerns, that it literally moved out of the house of God, the life of God. I find this remarkable. And if I could be so bold, most moves of God end because of that right there. It may not be a gross sin, but an accommodation of something that you have missed and longed for. 
talk to me in this house. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Now, I, I look at this text, and I want you to look at it again, because it is ruthless. I think sometimes in works of God, moves of God, we try not to be, we, we, we try extremely hard to not be ruthless. But when you have given birth to something, Christ Fellowship, you must understand that there are Tobias mm, that want to kill it. And if they can't kill it in its inception, they will wiggle their way into your life and slowly bleed you to death. And you won't even know it. In the early days of moves of God, nothing would offend you. Nothing would get you upset. Nothing would grieve your heart to the point of saying, I can't go into the house of God to see God move. But the longer moves of God happen and the longer that you are around a move of God, Tobias of offense can come into your life and the slightest of all slightest things could cause you to disengage from a move of God. It is like a flea that is in your bed that will nibble on you and bite you a thousand times until you can't handle it anymore. I've come to serve notice on the spirit of Tobiah in our lives. I said, I've come to serve notice on the spirit of Tobiah in our lives. If Tobiah is allowed to reign and to rule and to have an alliance in your life, it will push out mm, the word of God. It will push out the worship of God. And it will push out the service of God. What three areas, when Tobiah came to take up residence in the house of God, a sworn enemy of God, what three areas left the premises? The Levites, the worshipers, and the servers. Hear what I'm about to say. The spirit of Tobiah will, watch this, will cause you to focus on activity and say, I'm too busy, I'm too crowded, I don't have space, I can't run at this pace, I can't run at this rhythm, and one entrance door that is open to the spirit of Tobiah. He's not interested in one storeroom. You have to understand it. It would have been one thing if they would have given him one room, but he literally took over entire segments of the storerooms. And it will begin to push out the word of God, the worship of God, and the service of God. Tobiah took every inch of ground that the spiritual leader allowed him to take. It was subtle, long-term. It didn't happen overnight. But when Nehemiah came and he found out what had happened, now watch what happened. It grieved him bitterly grieved him bitterly to the point, my Lord, I want you to look at, just, just hold your spot there. There's a scripture, I can't find it out of Nehemiah chapter 10, but he got so angry about this that he would even pull the beards off of people's face. 
1325, blessed be the name of the Lord. Look at what he says. So I contended with them and cursed them, struck some of them, pulled out their hair and made them swear by God say, listen to me, this is important. When, when, when the spirit of God was grieved and compromised the house of God, Nehemiah became so grieved that the Bible says in, I look at it, verse nine, verse eight and nine, it says that they threw them all out of the house. They threw all the household go goods of Tobiah out of the room. Here's what's got to happen in the house of God, in my life and in your life. Because there are Tobias trying to step into my heart constantly. Does anybody wrestle with that in this room? Is there anybody that, listen, still struggles with some issues and some thoughts and some temptations? And you know if you give into it one time, it will come and take whatever ground you will give it. And then it will wait on another opportune time. And before you know it, you don't want to read your Bible. You don't want to come to church. You don't want to pray. You don't want to serve the God. You don't want to come to revival. And six months ago, it was all, oh, I cannot wait. I'm, I'm, I'm putting my world on hold, and I'm going to be in what God's doing. But one, giving in to a temptation opens the door. His foot gets inside, and he will take inch after inch, after inch, after inch, and then it rains on Sunday, well, we're going to watch at home. Well, I'm kind of tired today. I'm going to just stay at the house today. And the next thing, you're having church and you're enjoying it online, but then the next time, now you're picnicking and watching it on your phone as you're grilling. The next time, you even forget all about it, it's a day at the lake today. God wants me to have some family time. And so I'm going to go out on a boat ride on Sunday afternoon. And I'm enjoying this extra hour on the lake. And the next thing, you don't even pick up your phone. And then you get some Facebook messages. Wasn't church great today? It stings just a little bit. Then you get offended because nobody texts you wanting to know where you were. Well, they don't love me there anymore. And now you've made that a part of your heart. And what will go next? The word, the worship, and the service. Now watch this. I like it. It grieved him so much that he threw all the household goods of Tobiah out of the room. Can you imagine that? Evicting walking in the house of God, wherever the storerooms that he had, apartments, his bedding, his, his uh, bookshelves, you know, his computer table, his workstation, maybe his family, his children, literally grabbing the dresser and slinging it out the door, taking the comforter, slinging it out the door. I'm talking about his iMac, his iPad. Oh, and he just picks it up and he heaves them out the door. Well, that doesn't sound like love to me. Listen, 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 listen. There are some things we don't need to be loving about. I need to love at all times. But when it comes to a sworn enemy of God that has put himself in opposition to a move of God, I cannot be polite to something that wants to destroy me. Some of us need the spirit of Nehemiah to come upon us. Mm -hmm. I like this. So he throws out all the goods of Tobiah. And then Nehemiah said, I want them to cleanse the rooms. In other words, this nasty Ammonite, stinky evil, murderous, mocking enemy of God. Every foot that he has walked in this holy house of God, this wonderful habitation of the most holy that we have allowed into this house, I need you now to take some Clorox, Mr. Clean, whatever you got to do, and I need you to rub every place, square inch of these rooms to... To not even the smell of Tobiah is in this house. Watch it. He takes the stuff and he heaves it out. Put your rubber gloves on. We're going to cleanse the house.
Oh, it gets, it gets better. He said, we're going to cleanse it. Not, not wash it. Not <laughs> to breeze it. Air freshener. See, that's what we do a lot of times in the house of God. There's something that's stinking in our life. I just need to go down to the altar and let an altar person put their on me. Cover up my stench. I know there's some stuff in my life. I just need a, I just need some relief. I just need something just I just need something to make me I need some relief in my I'm going through some hard times. I'm going through some prayer. I just need some relief. And inside of you is a room that you have. And there's a Tobiah on the inside of you, and you just want to perfume him up. You got to understand that in revival, we sometimes cannot be polite. I'm not talking about you being an enemy and I'm being your enemy. I'm talking about the spirit of Tobiah. That's what I'm, I don't get mad and thinking I'm going to throw you out of the church. I'm not interested in throwing you out of the church and you're throwing me out of the church. I'm interested in what has taken up residence on the inside of you that is now affecting you. That's what I'm talking about that we have to be ruthless. He said, we're going to cleanse the rooms. Then we're going to bring back the articles into the house of God. We're going to bring it back. In other words, we're going to put some stuff in. Talk to me. We're going to put some stuff in. Things that have been removed, we're going to put it back in. Things that we've accommodated that's taken up space, caused us to neglect other things. We're going to bring back the articles of God that we have made room for other stuff. Now we're going to bring back in. Touch somebody and say, we got to bring it back in. Come on. Do you know, we got to bring it back in. Fill these coffers up. Look at it. Fill these coffers up. Fill them up. I need you. We've made accommodation. Tobiah, his family, they all have rooms in the house of God. I'm throwing them out. I'm throwing the kids out. I'm throwing the mama out. I'm throwing the daddy out. I'm throwing the cousins out. I'm throwing the aunties out. I'm throwing the uncles out. I'm throwing grandpa out. I'm, listen, I'm going to be ruthless. I'm getting rid of this because it's occupying and taking that space that is meant for God. Bring back the offerings, he said. Bring back the grain. Bring back the oil. Bring it all back into the house of God. We're going to put it back in. We have to understand that the enemy, if he cannot destroy you in one swoop, that he will try to eat your life one bite at a time. And he will nibble at you until you get to the point of throwing in the towel. So Jesus walks into the temple. His house. And the Bible says you just took a look around. He says, I got a great design for this house. It had a purpose. It has a purpose. And as he walks into his house, he sees a lot of alliances. Accommodations have been made. And he walks, he takes a look under the tables, on the tables, the activity, the community, the laughter, the frivolous behavior perhaps, the giving and the taking. And he walks out and he sleeps on what he saw. Some of the worst punishment in my life is when my daddy said, let me think about what I'm gonna do. No, daddy, just get it over with. Here's the belt. 
just get it over with. Because the worst thing is being in your room wondering how bad it's going to be when he comes to reckon with me. I'm dealing, with, evidently I'm dealing with a whole bunch of people that never got spanked. I don't know. Am I dealing with Gen Z and millennials in the house? Time out people only. I didn't, listen, I didn't get time out. The only time out I had was when I was getting up off the floor. How long that took. He'll be up in a minute, mama. Can you imagine what's going through Jesus' mind, Pastor Marty, as he's sleeping on what he just witnessed with his own eyes and what he called the house of prayer? My father's house. So whatever he drank that next morning when he got up and his breakfast, he comes from Bethany, he walks straight to Jerusalem. First place he goes is the temple. The temple is filled with robust activity. The marketplace has all the aromas as chestnuts are being roasted and meals are being prepared and bread is being baked for the day and donkeys and horses bringing in labors to the food market and here Jesus walks by them all and he walks straight into his house on a mission. He doesn't try to negotiate with them, talk them into anything. He walks straight in and he takes these tables and the Bible says that he flips them over. He makes himself a belt. And this makes me believe that Jesus wasn't a timeout person. <laughs> he makes him a whip. Now notice, and runs them out. He didn't say, y'all get out. I'm throwing you out. I'm thrusting you out. And if you're not willing to go, I'm going to whack you. Y'all don't think that. Like Jesus is all limp-wristed. No, he's defending the honor of his father's house. Would Jesus physically assaulted them? I, I don't, uh, you know, that's a debate for another day. But you don't make a whip unless you're willing to use it. Don't pull out a gun unless you're willing to use it. It's what they say. I don't know. I'm not giving you any instruction, but you understand. Don't, don't pull that knife out unless you're willing to use it because somebody's going to be bigger and badder than you that's going to get it done. You understand what I'm saying? You've got... I digress. And he thrusts them out, throws them out runs them out. And then he says, you have turned, watch this. Everybody say turn. This place into a den of thieves and you removed it from being the house of prayer. You made it about accommodating your needs and removed the most important thing. Tobias come in all shapes and forms. But there's vengeance in the eyes of God today, not at you. He's not mad at you. He's not coming to be angry with you, but he's coming after the Tobias in your heart because there's some tables that you have in your heart that you have sat down with. There are things in your life that you've opened the door to, just a small crack, and now it's stealing from you. It doesn't belong there. It has no place there. And Jesus says, I know it's intent. It is to take you from what I created you to be to make you into something lesser. It wants an alliance with you. Not a complete takeover, but just a compromise. Just a relaxing. Just a settling down. Just coasting. And he's coming for the Tobias today with vengeance in his eyes. Your Bible says this, 1 Corinthians chapter 16, for those of you that need to make the connection. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 says it this way. 
Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God and it says and you are not your own? Can you think with me for just a moment the same God that instructed Nehemiah to go to the temple, to the house of God, and remove Tobiah and all of his loved ones out of the house of God. And the same Jesus that walked into his own house filled with anger as he saw that the house of God became everything but a house of prayer. It became a house of community. It became a house of small groups. It became a house of activity, fellowship, but everything but the house of prayer. And God said, when Jesus walked in there, he said, you have turned it into a den of thieves. My house shall be a house of prayer. And in your own temple, where the holy of holy lives and resides on the inside of the very core of you, but your heart storerooms on the peripheral have made accommodations and alliances and negotiations with things in your life that can coexist with God, but God can't coexist with them. And they eat away your purpose, your strength, your focus, and your drive for the presence of God. Am I saved? Yes. But those outer chambers, you have given rooms. The room of negativity. I'm nobody. I'm nothing. I'll never amount to anything. God could never use me. Starting slow. I can't speak. I'm not rich enough. I'm not. There's a room. And anytime God touches your heart to do something, he opens that door. Not God, but Tobiah. Hey, don't forget who you are. Remember you're on your third marriage. Remember your business failed. Remember you made the proclamation of being saved and, and yet three weeks later you backslid. You just need to sit down and be quiet. Yes, sir. He goes back into his room. And you'll sit in this room filled with guilt and shame and negativity. He's coming for that time. Unforgiveness is a room. She walked out on me and left the kids. We had dreams and aspirations of being in our own home and retiring together and enjoying each other for life and having grandbabies, but she was unfaithful to me. And I hate her. And she'll never see the kids again. And I hope she dies. There's a room. And that room may be some of the most polluted and vile room that you'll ever have that you give space to the devil. Because your Bible says from that room, the aroma of unforgiveness leads to bitterness and then it causes all types of sickness and disease. Your Bible says it is the root of a lot of ailments in our bodies. But as long as you don't think about it, you're okay. As long as it does not come up, you're all right. But you're in the house of God and you're wanting more of him. Lord, I want the freedom. I need the healing. And God says, I need you to let me have that room. Because if I heal you, you'll be sick again in just a couple weeks. And what I plan to do will not be halfway. I need that room. So 
Some of us have a sexual addiction room. We're addicted to porn. Every guy we look at, we wonder. Every girl we look at, we wonder what that would be like, what she would be like, what he would be like. And in your heart, you know it doesn't belong, but because of something that you opened up in the years past, that room is still there and you have not cleansed it. You recognize that it's a room. You've opened the door and you've repented of it, but you've not cleansed it. Sometimes cleansing is a flip phone. See, I don't, I, y'all. How serious are you about getting free from this? Well, people will laugh at me. Well, it's killing you. It's destroying your marriage. It's destroying your sex life. It's destroying your relationship with kids. You can't walk into church without lusting. And you're in a revival and a move of God and the spirit of God. And, and then you just get so frustrated because what that's going to do is, listen, you're not receiving anything at that house. You're not getting your freedom in that house. And you pull away. See what it wants to do? It wants to pull away. It wants to pull the service. It wants to pull the word. It wants to pull the worship. Get you out. There's got to be a cleansing. The computer. Honey, I'm not going to get on the computer unless you know about it. I'm not going to get on my phone when you're asleep at night. And this goes for women too. A lot of you guys are addicted. A lot of the women are addicted to pornography. You're not getting what you need from your husband with the uh, emotional support. And so you just love to touch and to hug other men and wonder what that would be like. And for that individual to say something sweet to you, it just melts your heart and you're having an emotional affair. I'm saying this not to get on to anybody, but I'm telling you, there's so much more that God wants to do in your spirit and your heart today, but God's going to have to come into you, the temple and find the storerooms of your heart, the things that you have stored that nobody else knows about. And he needs you to unlock the door. And he says, if you'll give me access to this room, I'm going to throw them out with you. And then I'm going to come in and cleanse the room. I got to have the room cleansed. It's the subtle things. What I watch on television, what I listen to, what I expose my spirit to, the video games I watch or the video games I play and the advertisements, the advertisements that are there, their witchcraft, their nudity, their things that are just opening up the crack of your door. And the next thing you know that you stay a little bit longer instead of flipping it. Now you're there two seconds from two seconds. Now you're there to five seconds, five seconds. Now you're clicking on it. And what happens is he gets more and more embedded into the room. And before you know it, you don't want to go to church. You don't want to have intimacy with your wife. You don't want to pray. You don't want to go to the house of God, you say, you know what? I need more of my me time. I need more of my family time. I don't want to raise my kids in the house of God. What stupidity and asinine thoughts are those? It is a revelation of the spirit of Tobiah coming in and taking up time. So you'd rather stay at home and let them play video games than being in the house of God. Can you think of how we have turned this thing upside down? Well, I don't want them to be burned out on church, but yet you will march them to soccer practice an hour away and they will spend an hour and a half in the rain and the cold and there you are watching every single second of it. Then you'll go on the weekend and give them a coach $1,500 with a brand new uniform and bust yourself all over America to watch them play a 90 minute game. But yet you give them to that, but it has little to no value. And we say, I don't want my child to be burned out in house of God. Can we, with the same spirit that we trust for somebody to be healed of cancer, to have the same faith that if I raise my kids on a Sunday night in a two to three hour worship service, that God will somehow take care of them and they not get burned out. That is stupidity gone to see. 
But isn't that how the devil works? Well, we don't want him to be a church kid. Don't want him to grow up in church. I was forced to go to church. I hated church. I hated it. I had a drug problem. I was drugged to church yes, all sir. the time. Yes, sir. So let's, let's, well, let's work your plan. Let's just stay home. Let's just stay home. And somehow, someway, God will meet my child in the middle of Fortnite. Somehow, he's going to get a revelation of God that I'm going to love God with all my heart. Now, let me tell you how you love God with all of your heart. You be around people that love God with all their heart. Iron sharpens iron. Your child's being sharpened by somebody in Europe that's cussing and using all types of vulgarity with their headphones on, and you know nothing about it, and you're making muffins in the oven, helping in the oven, and you're thinking everything is good. Parents, you have to understand, you are the spiritual doorkeeper of the of the life of God of your children. When they get of the age, they can turn away from God if they want to, but not let it be said when I stand before him. We were involved in the greatest move of the Spirit that Christ Fellowship has ever seen. There have been 31,000 people baptized. We have seen the eyes open, the lame walk, the deaf here. We have what psoriasis melt off people's body. And I want to stay home. And you stand before God, and God says, why didn't you take that three-year-old to my house? I wanted to speak to them, and I wanted to touch them, and I wanted them to see the power of God. God, have mercy. Safest place on the earth is to bring up a child in the house of God. That's healthy. That's seeing God, experiencing God. And then they get to 15 and they backslide. You'll stand before God and say, God, I did all I knew to do. I did what I was supposed to do. Rather than God saying to you, I visited you. But you wouldn't come to prayer. Your family wouldn't come to prayer. And now they're 16 and they have no desire for God. And now you're crying out for me to do something and to undo what you did over 14 years of their life. That Tobiah of the Western American mindset will rob you of an encounter with God. I walked through this life one time, Chase, one time. I've got fewer days in front of me than I have behind me. That's a sobering thought. Oh, to have had this when I was 30. Oh, to have witnessed this when I was 40. Oh, to have this at the age of 50. But five years ago, he came. To be involved in what I believe as researchers and historians will come and make their own conclusions about this, but what I believe to be in my life a very historical move of God. Now, where it falls in the history of America, I have no idea. But I know that there are churches that are now lit that were dormant. I know that there were pastors that were ready to quit, now activated again. I know prayer ministries and churches that had two to three people praying a week now have 80 to 100 people praying a week. I know churches never seen a miracle in their life all of a sudden now testifying and calling me and saying, you will not believe what God did. You will not believe how God healed this and how God re, uh, rearranged that, how God saved that and how God delivered this and how that eye was open and how that lame person walked. And I just sit back in my office sometimes just overwhelmed and I can't read them all because it's just overwhelming. And I say, oh God, thank you for allowing me to be a part of something. Yeah. Yeah. I embrace this climb. Here's my prayer. And I close with this slide. Lord Jesus, would you please reveal to me any affection that grieves you or offends you or causes me to love you less? 
I wrote this down while I was driving about five months ago. And it just came to me that in my heart, I, I, I felt my heart slipping from him. In the middle of a move of God in revival, sitting on the chairs and, and watching God restore and to reclaim and to deliver and to heal, I found my heart crying out, oh God, I don't want my heart to love you less in the middle of a move of God. And I gave him permission, God, any affection in me. Now, affections are not bad. There's some good affections. But any affection that grieves you, anything I've latched on to that I, that I negotiated with you and rationalized with you, Anything that offends you or causes me to love you less, God, would you please reveal it to me? And notice what I did not say. God, would you take it? There's a difference between God taking something and me giving him something. If he takes it from me, I have to partner, God, I give this to you. I acknowledge with godly sorrow how I've missed this. God, my heart is turned to this source of entertainment. I love it. I want it. I crave it. But God, I know it grieves you when they use your name in vain. He's my favorite actor. And I'll walk right up into that movie theater and I will hear nine times my Lord's name used in vain. Two or three nude scenes, sexual innuendos, mockery of the Christian faith, highlighting the LBGQT community, parading it in front of your face. And I'll say, oh God, anything that grieves you that I, am a, uh, that I am drawn to, would you reveal it to me? And I'll give it to you. Well, I don't see anything wrong with it. I feel God's okay with it. I feel good about it. It doesn't affect me. Are you basing that upon the word? Or the Georgia version of the Bible interpretation? Are you saying that upon mommy and daddy and granddaddy and grandpapa that were just saved enough to get to heaven? and compromise their whole life or, or, or is your nose in the book and you're honest and say, God, anything that offends you, would you reveal it to me? And God, I so wanna love you and so be in love with you that I don't wanna do anything that offends you and grieves you. I don't see anything wrong with it. You're not the person that... You stand before the Lord, I didn't see anything wrong with it. Well, my book said... My book said... You mean I can't cuss? No, you can cuss all you want to. I don't see anything wrong with it. What does your book say? Well, I was raised that way. Bless your heart. I was too. Cussing all over the place. But when I got saved, I got a new tongue. You hear what I'm saying? Well, I just can't help it. Ah, see the program? Ah, 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 ah. What does the book say? Anything that grieves you, offends you, causes me to love you less, Lord, would you reveal it to me? This is a process. You ready for it? All right. We're going to kill this spirit tonight. Some of you are going to get in the water tonight and you're going to drown it. There are going to be Tobias all over the water. Little spirits dying. You're going to drown it. You're going to suffocate it. 
show no mercy to them. Because I promise you, it'll show no mercy to you when you're in divorce court. It'll show no mercy to you when you're in rehab. It'll show no mercy to you while you're putting the drugs in your vein. It'll show no mercy to you. Stand your feet all across the room. Today's message is entitled Unholy Alliances. Unholy Alliances. We're going to throw them out. We're going to cleanse the room. And we're going to bring back. Put back in. Lift your hands all across the room. Thank you, Lord. We love you, Holy Ghost. I'm gonna pray that prayer. Lord, anything in my life that grieves you or offends you, that causes me to love you less, would you reveal it to me? Yeah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Bless you, Lord. I bless you, Lord. We thank you, God. All of heaven and all of earth is witnessing this moment. Thank you. Uh -huh. Set us free, God. Walk through my heart. I give you permission to evaluate the rooms. And Lord, show me if there's a Tobiah that I have opened the door to. In the mighty name of Jesus and everybody said, amen and amen. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Thank you, Lord. And praise God. We thank you for being here this morning. I want to remind you guys Again, five o'clock prayer, six o'clock revival. Doors will open at 445. Rest this afternoon, take a nap. So that you're ready to go this evening. You ready? I bless you. Have an incredible afternoon. I'll see you tonight. The North Georgia Revival. Thank you so much.